Hej, det er Frederik fra Exopolitik Danmark. Jeg er her med historikeren Richard Dolan her i Washington D.C. ved X-konferencen i 2010 i starten af maj. Uh, Richard, I understand that you're a historian mm -hmm. and you've looked into a lot of different UFO cases and yes. you're, you've looked, uh, looked into a lot of uh, documents, uh, mm -hmm. declassified documents under the Freedom of Information Act. And have you come across anything from Scandinavia, or have you have have you researched any Scandinavian things from Scandinavia? Yes, indeed, there have been a long history, of very interesting, uh, unusual uh, sightings of objects in the Scandinavian region. Uh, certainly, famously, we have the situation right after the Second World War of the the ghost rocket phenomenon. This is primarily over Sweden. Uh, during the whole summer of 1946, spring and summer and fall of 1946, uh, objects that really, I think, have not been satisfactorily explained to this day were seen over Sweden, some of which uh, we know landed. We have State Department records, for example, describing the concern of uh, American authorities over what was happening over Swedish airspace. Uh, what was, I think, particularly interesting about that was that uh, a, a couple of American generals, uh, General James Doolittle and, uh, and uh, David Sarnoff, both very powerful people in America, went to Sweden informally in the capacity supposedly of private citizens uh, where they conferred with the Swedish authorities and immediately after that the Swedish government clamped down on all information about the so-called ghost rockets. So it was obviously something of interest and uh, there was speculation at the time that the rockets, the so-called rockets, were Soviet missiles of some sort, maybe like a, their version of the V-2 missile. The, the problem with that theory is that there's just no evidence to this day that that was the case. Uh, furthermore, the, that phenomenon spread, it appears to have spread through other parts of Europe that year. Uh, France, Greece famously had quite a lot of sightings of these. So, uh, whatever it was, it uh, doesn't have a good explanation to this day. We've got a very good uh, document trail about that. Uh, we know that in the mid-1980s, some documents pertaining to the ghost rockets were declassified. And, and we know that the Swedish government looked into it. They did not have an explanation for this, at least in those documents. But what were the kind of performance of these of these craft or of these? They, they were flying, in many cases, very low altitude. Uh, some eyewitnesses said that they saw flames or sparks coming out of the, the back end of them. Uh, some of them were very, very silent or very, very quiet or almost silent. Uh, some were said to maneuver uh, by eyewitnesses. So. I mean, behaviors that we would say today would be like UFOs. Uh, what they were, we don't really know. I think the most uh, fascinating um, Scandinavian UFO events um, started in the early 1980s and they continue to this day in the, the tiny, remote Norwegian valley of Hestalen. Uh, of course, this is known among researchers worldwide, and rightly so. Uh, this is just an incredible... Uh, maybe uh, almost unparalleled series of events. There's, there's a few places in the world where you've got these hot spots of activity, but Hestalen is absolutely incredible. Here's a, a village where maybe there's a thousand people living there, maybe less. Out in the middle of nowhere, beautiful countryside, and there are these objects, right? Light phenomenon, sometimes people see craft, Sometimes people have claimed to see beings associated with these craft. Uh, we've had a long history of scientific teams trying to uh, get measurements and succeeding in getting measurements of these objects. This is just um, a phenomenon that uh, deserves international scientific study. It's getting some, but it really deserves a lot more. They are, I understand they have a whole container set up in Hestalen where they have all this video equipment and, and uh, scientific research going on. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, there's international cooperation. I know there, there are Italian uh, team, a team from Italy that's uh, co cooperating with Norwegians on this. Uh, I think this is all very good, and, and certainly the equipment, even in the last few years, has continued to capture some very, very unusual phenomena. I've uh, seen it in, in video form and it's just fascinating. Um, 
I just, uh, I, I have speculated, and this is just my own thought, that uh, is there, <clears throat> for example, an underground facility? Okay, well, what makes you think theoretically well, about that? Well, I, I, the Norwegians, first of all, have very advanced, uh, history, long history of doing advanced underground work themselves. Yeah. Uh, I, I how is it connected with this phenomenon in Hestal and how? Uh, how well, I, I'm still trying to work okay. that out. <laughs> okay. I don't know okay. exactly, but um, there's nothing visible mm. that I can see that would cause the phenomenon. So the only thing that I'm wondering is, is there something underground? And yeah. it's just I admit it's purely speculation on yeah. my part, but I, I do yeah. wonder. Yeah. Um, you know, there there are periodically very interesting sightings in the Scandinavian region of uh, beings, uh, alleged beings that seen by witnesses. Um, and you know, other than Hestalen, there's still many, many uh, sightings of what we would call UFOs by people throughout. I mean, in Norway, Sweden, Finland, yeah, uh, Denmark, and so forth. Uh, there's a lot going on up there. I think there's also a case from uh, Spitsbergen yeah. in, in, in the 50s in, in Norway, which is a part of Norway. Exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, it's an island. Uh, there, there has been uh, allegations, really, from the 1950s onward of a crash of a UFO there. Um, it's one of those things where you get researchers to this day not really in agreement on that event. Uh, for me, it depends on the day of the week what I think about the mm -hmm. Spitsbergen crash. There are, there are times when I look at that and I, I really do wonder if, if an actual UFO went down there. I, I would not rule it out, mm -hmm. actually, but uh, there, there are reasons to be a little bit cautious about it, too, so I, I hold that one up uh, as, yeah. as a possible case. Yeah. I just remember one of the, the witnesses from the Disclosure Project, he mentions it briefly. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, Lauren Nissen, I think it is. That's right. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. He mentions that case, or he mentions that somebody he's, yeah. he watched something, some message go through uh, about a saucer or yeah. a craft crashing in, in Spitsburg. Well, part of the problem that we have in this field is that uh, we're dealing with a topic that deals with the national security of many nations, and they're not particularly forthcoming. Uh, unfortunately, about a lot of this information. So, I, I liken it to like being a little kid outside a store window, with you know, looking at it when it's dark, and you're trying to look inside and seeing what's going on. Uh, that's sort of like what we're doing as researchers at times, uh, trying to peek into the dark recesses of uh, of our government and military. So, um, we may not know about the Spitsbergen event for sure for a while, but I, I think one day we'll know the truth on that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. Frederick, yeah. it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very Hope much. Hope to see you next year. Absolutely. <laughs>